Hello, everybody. Happy Saturday to you. It's Dave Neal, stand-up comic and host of Bachelor Nation News. Now, I didn't want to come at you guys without my sleeves on. Uh, that's kind of, you know, kind of an aggressive power move here. But it is Saturday, and I'm doing laundry. So this is the best version of me you get. And the best version of Brian and Rachel are what we're getting right now, which is ugly because a divorce battle is ripping through Bachelor Nation. Text messages tell a new story story. So I have not personally read the court filings, although I'm being told they may be arriving in my inbox from a source. Uh, with that said, rather than do a he said, she said type of situation, I think the best case with a uh, divorce that's so public right now is to let it all play out, listen to what the judge has to say, and trust that that's an honest decision. Now, in the meantime, of course, that's not going to prevent you and me and everyone else online from discussing uh, some of the things going on, essentially arguing over how much money Rachel and Brian have made and how much she is going to agree to pay him for a period of two years. If she made $100,000 a month and he made $0 a month, you could imagine she would be paying him $50,000 a month, just to break it down very simply. If genders were reversed and Brian was the breadwinner and for two years she didn't make any money, he would be paying her, at least in the state of California, as far as I know. That's how it works. The shared assets they built during their marriage will be divided. And of course, a judge is going to have to look into how much money each have actually made. She could claims he had more money in his Venmo than he was claiming, uh, and uh, whether or not they're both being forthcoming with their expenses is yet to be seen, but as far as everything uh, you know goes, it should, it should be exposed, and the fair thing done, and if a judge has to do a little bit of extra digging, that should be made of note too. Like, Could there be a scenario if Brian is lying about all of these things and he's trying to get money out of her? Could there be a scenario where the judge sees through that and gives Brian nothing? Sure. That's why I have a hard time believing that either side is being um, disingenuous in this instance, to use a very popular word. So I believe both Rachel and Brian are trying their best to navigate this scenario. You as an audience can either take the bait and pick one side versus the other, or, or you can just see it for what it is, which is a sad example of a relationship that just didn't work out. Now, with all that said, I'll read some of your comments, but also we're going to talk about these new text messages right here. I've you know, I can't, I can't claim that I've always been this way because I've taken the bait before and thought someone was a bigger villain than they actually were. Now, to be full, you know, fully transparent, I've interviewed Brian and I've actually gone to his chiropractor office and he's adjusted me with his golden angelic hands. And I also have a lot of respect for Rachel and I've defended her uh, ad nauseum to extent uh, in the past. I think my record speaks for itself. With that said, New information is coming out that was previously not reported on by the gossip rags, which would be very interesting because Rachel obviously is gossip rags adjacent. And by that, I mean her co-host, Van, worked for TMZ, although I think they had a falling out. I'm not really sure. And, and by the way, I love Higher Learning, their podcast. I think they do a really good job when they have uh, topics they are willing to cover. Not every topic they're willing to cover, but again, that's, uh, that's for, for up to them to decide what to do, right? So... Rachel worked for Extra and, and still exists in that news of celebrity and entertainment news, right? Well, I wouldn't be surprised, and I don't want to put my tinfoil hat on, that people would cherry pick information that would lead the audience to side with her before siding with Brian. And I just think it's fair, don't you all, that we let it all air out, right? So that's what's going to happen. Brian Abasolo provides new text messages, refutes claim Rachel Lindsay was shocked by him filing for divorce. Now, if I were Brian... And I filed for divorce. And then she says, oh, I was blindsided. I didn't even know this was happening. And that wasn't the actual case. I would be upset because now you're going to have a whole audience that is going to pity her and her situation. And I personally just don't think that's fair. I think what's fair is we all have access to all of the information to make our own judgments. And if we don't have access to that information, hey, let's just not make a judgment. We're so, we're so hell-bent on everyone having a take on everything. Just once in a lifetime, I'd love it if someone was like, you know what, I feel like I don't have all the information. And that's where I feel like I am at right now. Um, so while their gloves have come off, my sleeves have come off, and your fingers are going on 
to the like button. Hit it an odd number of times. The Bachelorette couple filed for divorce in January after more than four years of marriage. Brian is providing new evidence in his latest response to his estranged wife, Rachel's filing. In new court documents obtained by people, the chiropractor tells his side of the story as he claims the former bachelorette lead wasn't surprised or shocked by his decision to divorce. So there are going to be things that are shared here that are kind of being played out for the public's interest. And it's kind of going to be one of those examples of like, who started it? How ugly is it going to get? Who's going to take the high road? And I'll tell you this right now. My initial intuition was that there was more to this story than was letting on because Rachel remained so quiet. But I respect that you would want something to play out through the court system. Some folks are actually giving Brian more credit here for the way he's handled the legal side of things. Now, there could be collateral damage, which is people saying, oh, Brian's trying to take money from her and this and that. But as far as legally goes, you, you, you hate to say this, but it's almost like you, you want to come at these things in a strong way to to make sure that you 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 are compensated justly. Again, the collateral damage there would be people saying, uh, "Oh, why is he doing this? You know, he's taking advantage of her. This and that," um, which may or may not be true. Uh, but I think the judge will decide what's fair. And I think at that point we should go. Well, what's fair is fair, right? That's why we have a judicial system. In the new court documents obtained by people, okay, when Lindsay submitted her responsive declaration to Abasola's filing, she claimed that she discovered his decision to terminate their marriage via text message in late June. Why does it say in a text message in late June? She alleges that I think that I think that was poorly written. I think she discovered it in January, but this was reported in late June. She alleged that Brian sent her a message that simply read, "Hey, I just wanted to let you know that I officially filed 30 minutes after he left their shared home." Now Brian claims that Lindsay fails to disclose that he sent her a text message stating his intentions to move their separation to the next step before filing for divorce. Rachel, so here's the text message. And again, I haven't verified this. This is verified through people. Rachel, walking into the room because I didn't reply to your text per your timeline, then raise your voice for not getting the immediate answer you want, is the kind of one-sided controlling aspect of our relationship which has brought us to this point. My inability to communicate, as you've called it, is to prevent these kinds of reactions. It often feels like you must have what you want without considering any state of mind I'm in. I'm sorry for not replying to your text, but honestly, I don't really want to be on the receiving end of your wordsmithing anymore. I don't want to be here any longer than I have to. I want to regain some aspect of my self-respect back. Please, let's keep future communications in writing, written down on paper, email, text, to prevent any additional friction as we move to the next step. We can speak in the future in the presence of a neutral party or something. Right now, I just can't do it. I haven't been able to for a while. Respectfully, good night. Again, I think when a relationship is ending, what everything that's said can, I mean, in, a, in, in any toxic relationship, anything that is said can be twisted against you. Not saying that's what Rachel's doing to Brian or vice versa, but the idea that they want everything on paper is kind of smart. Uh, you see this in custody battles where you'll get like a court appointed um, app where you can only text your partner through this app and that way it gets logged almost like a stenographer or whatever the hell, right? And honestly, having covered other court cases, um, it's it's almost like text messages while we, we, we trust they're not being, you know, fraudulently put together, what we've seen in the past is that even that doesn't always tell the full story. Not just a text message, but what came before that text message? What are the full conversations that are happening here? It's really sad. And again, I'm not some conspiracy theorist. My guess is the relationship had a lot of bitterness. Brian claims he moved for her. And he also claims in his document, she gave him an ultimatum, move for me, or else. And he also mentions that she was disingenuous at a point, which we'll get back into. So anyway, I wanted to take this moment just to tell you for a side note, if you want much lighter conversation, because this is kind of dark here, I interviewed Christina Mandrell yesterday on my podcast, The Rush Hour, with her mom, Erlene Mandrell, the youngest of the Mandrell sisters, a performing group um, etched in the history and folklore of Nashville, right? A country music group. She was on the show Hee Haw, and we get into all of this world she was a part of, Cover Girl, the first professional female drummer, and all of these other things on today's episode of Driving with Dave, which is on the Rush Hour with Dave Neal. You can click this link, and it'll just show a link in the description. It'll show all of the ways you can listen to that free episode. Okay, back to 
to the show here. Got to uh, pay the bills with the podcast. Shortly after filing for divorce in January, Brian shared a post about the pair's separation on Instagram. After more than four years of marriage, Rachel and I have made the difficult decision to part ways and start anew. My parents have been married forever and I'm a family man, but sometimes loving yourself and your partner means you must let go. I wanted you to hear it from the source before the blogs start making up their own reality. Please respect the spaces of our family and friends as we figure out our next steps. Respectfully, Brian. And of course, she didn't participate in this. You know, sometimes during a breakup, they'll have a joint statement. Um, days later, Lindsay opened up about their decision to part ways on her higher learning podcast, calling the separation a difficult time, which I'm sure it was and is. Lindsay didn't share much, but promised to eventually get into the details of the split. Now is not the time. I'm just trying to take it day by day. I believe that it was very tough on her. The information coming out in the court documents is that their relationship was agreed upon to be over months earlier. Maybe a fight was the last straw. Again, we're trying to figure this all out. In the end, do we have a right to know it? Well, I mean, it's public court information. I think we have a duty as audience to try to not, um, I don't know, Sensational, sensationalize it in any way, which which is that there's one terrible person and the other person's some perfect victim. No, they thought they had a relationship, which I'm sure they agreed upon. Um, I'm sure it was real. A lot of people say, well, the relationship must have all been fake. I don't think that's the case. I think what happened was, you know, there was a lot of bitterness. He felt bitter that she didn't support his business. He was probably bitter that he moved across the country and wasn't able to, I don't know, flourish in the way that she was. And, um, you know, the judge is going to look through their expenses and see who owes who what. Someone commented this on yesterday's video, which talked about the disingenuous nature. So Brian had mentioned something. He accused Rachel. I said shadiness, but he, he, he said he discovered that Rachel had been disingenuous while they were living in Dallas. And he also said that that disingenuous discovery led him to almost not uh, carry on with the relationship and the marriage. My thought with that was that that disingenuous thought could be something fraudulent, something like so-and-so was a friend, but then I found out you were actually ex-boyfriend. It could be something like that. It could be infidelity. I laid all of that out. I don't think Brian or anybody would put disingenuous in court papers if there wasn't weight behind it. Because if there wasn't something disingenuous, she could essentially call him out saying, what are you, what are you uh, smashing my character? And I, and, and I said, if that doesn't happen, it could be because there are receipts and things we don't know about. It could be dirtier and nastier than they're even letting on. It could be messier than we see from the outside looking in. We don't know what is in people's closets, right? So I got a response from somebody, which is fine. I appreciate the commentary. Dave, you're also disingenuous by speculating that his use of the adjective suggested infidelity. I disagree. I don't think I'm being disingenuous at all. I think I'm being as authentic as possible and sharing my opinion and my intuition here, which is I kind of feel like we're not exactly onto this story yet. And I think I've got a track record that's pretty high of a batting average in saying, hey, guys, for for fear of being thrown into the hatred that people have for Brian, aren't we kind of being a little hypocritical here? That's my thought. I don't think that's disingenuous at all. You guys let me know. If you would like to join my Patreon and not be disingenuous, the most ingenuous way you could do that is to go to patreon.com slash Dave Neal. See how I had to make that about me? Uh, I'm sort of half kidding, but you can join. You're also consistently defending Brian in rationalizing rationalizing his business expenses. What do you think Rachel incurs? Costs of management, legal agent, stylists, et cetera, are all business expenses as well. So why do you accord him the benefit of the doubt, but not her? I don't know how much... Um, now, now, I say this as a, as a 15-year-long member of the Screen Actors Guild. I don't know how much she can write off a stylist. Um, when it comes to Screen Actors Guild, you can only write off clothing and wardrobe that is period specific. So if I had clothing, and again, again, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a uh, accountant, but if I had, if I was in a, um, a boardwalk empire and I needed to buy clothes that only resemble the 1920s and I wasn't going to wear them in my day-to-day life, sure. But if I wanted to buy nice Air Jordans and wear them on camera, I wouldn't get to write those off unless I could prove I only wear the Air Jordans because I have a podcast that talks about Air Jordans. Do you know what I mean? Does this make sense? Am I being smart here or am I being disingenuous? So, Do I rationalize his business expenses? Well, I look at them and I go, well, having a brick and mortar, I do see those expenses being different than what Rachel incurs. Why do I say that? Because, well, first of all, I've got family that have a brick and mortar, so I know what those expenses look like, and they can be very high, and the the break-even can be very low, and I know how much money influencers and people can make, and how high that 
windfall can be. If you have a million followers on Instagram, you can ostensibly make a million bucks a year. You might make a little bit more, a little bit less than that, but it is no surprise that even after she doesn't have her extra income, extra TV that is, she still claims she was making $60,000 a month. That's $720,000 a year, which to be honest, I'm not surprised about based on her social media presence and all of the other things she has going on. I mean, doesn't she have like Lexus uh, brand deal? I mean, these they, they pay a considerable amount of money to influencers, whether it's um, justified or not, that's up to the companies. I'm a capitalist and I say, hey, if you're not doing anything illegal, go make that money. So I said brick and mortar jobs are completely different. Well, first of all, they responded and saying, I'm calling BS and bias. Now, 18 people agreed with that. Maybe you've got a point. Maybe I do have a bias. That's fine to call out. Um, I'm going to try to be as fair as possible, even if I think, mm, Brian's not the devil. There's probably more to the story here. So if I defend the person getting the shorter end of the stick, it's probably not to say, well, he should get the longer end and she should get the shorter end. It's more to say, I'm sure they should all get equal lengths of the stick. That's all socialist Dave in me. Everyone should get an equal. We should redistribute the lengths of the stick is what I'm trying to say. Sometimes I wonder, and by the way, I could be flying a little too close to the sun here with my own um, cockiness, but sometimes I wonder if I'm too smart for this uh, for this conversation. I wonder that. I go, are we even having the same conversation? Now, you could say she travels all over the country for interviews or things like that. Those are all business expenses. Sure, absolutely. And again, I'm not the judge. I'm not looking at any of their personal information. I'm just saying I can imagine if he's not getting enough people to walk through the door that he could very well only be having an income of $1,400 a month when you take a, away the uh, costs of Los Angeles real estate and things like that. As far as I know, I don't know if she rents a studio. I'm assuming she doesn't pay for any of that stuff when it comes to her podcast. I'm assuming that's paid for by, is it Wondery or whoever the, the Bill Simmons, the ringer, the ringer, that's who it is, the ringer, which by the way, I am so pro not being part of a podcast network. I think it's such a bad idea. She can make so much more money on her own. That's just my opinion. Um, if you, no one's asking for it, I'm just letting you know. Hold on to that equity and ownership in your own thing. Um, but anyhow, so yeah, she could have a lot of expenses. Sure, absolutely, she could. But it doesn't change my point that I think, you know, her exponential, uh, so put it this way, he's he's only gonna make as much as a chiropractor. He can make some in the influencing world. He's only gonna make as much as as many people can get through that door. He is a donut shop selling donuts in person. She is a donut shop selling donuts to the internet, being an influencer. Your audience is as big as as many people will watch it. So do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying that makes her a better person or worse. I'm just looking at the numbers here as to why she might make so much more money than he does. Uh, someone said, I do believe she should pay because if it were the other way around, we would all expect it, but 10,000 isn't that far from 16. Um, so anyway, read some of your comments here. All of this is just further convincing me that Brian is an opportunistic asshole who didn't have the right intentions when he married her and likely never truly loved her. When you truly love someone and things don't work out due to different career goals, you still treat them with respect in your divorce and breakup. The fact he's trying to squeeze her dry by falsely claiming he makes no money and not vacating the home she brought all on her own, bought on all her own, just proves he's a sleazeball. A lot of upvotes. Then someone said, when you truly love someone and things don't work out, you still treat them with respect in your divorce. Not necessarily. I know too many people who were in love, but then come divorce time, things got very ugly fast, right? The bitterness that comes in a divorce is when you think you weren't treated fairly. It is pretty rare when a divorce ends super amicably. I have family members that have spent millions in divorce. It is sad, but again, lawyers, while we do love a good professional lawyer, are the ones who make money in divorce court, right? Lawyers are the ones who make the money. Everyone else loses. So instead, I'm not a lawyer, but I feel like I usually hear lawyers give advice to not vacate the marital home. So people were wondering, why doesn't he just leave? And it's like, well, the same reason Sandoval and Ariana didn't leave. There is something about like staying and making sure you don't lose out uh, in, in any sort of way in the, in the court. They both sound awful and everything that has come out makes the marriage look like a sham. Didn't Rachel say shortly before the divorce was announced that they were planning on trying to have kids soon? Just goes to show you never know what's going on behind and closed doors. I'm hearing information that they knew this relationship was bad for months, that they weren't, you know, even, you know, I don't know. I don't, I'm not saying they were on a break. I don't have that kind of information, but that the relationship was just not in a good place for months, which would be weird considering I believe she was on Nick's 
small podcast discussing no it's a large podcast uh be fair dave don't be disingenuous disingenuous dave um where she was discussing you know some thoughts about wanting to have kids and again maybe maybe a year earlier you wanted to have kids and you just you know for the sake of not wanting a complicated conversation you just lie I, i'm okay i'm okay with those lies i don't think it would be disingenuous or it would be but it would be a justified disingenuous if they were lying to save face while they figured out what they wanted to do because you know i mean maybe you're on a break and you resolve it and you don't want those you don't want some podcast episode out where you guys were fighting you know it's like it's like keep a brave front until everything fails and then take the gloves off not that it should ideally be framed as an ultimatum, but Rachel saying move to California with me or this relationship won't work isn't crazy to me. I think most people would try to avoid a long distance relationship when not absolutely necessary. And it's uh, crazy that it would be a breaking point in the relationship if there is no foreseeable endpoint to a long distance marriage. Uh, and then the, the interesting response here is someone said, I think the telling piece here is that she was ready and willing to drop her marriage for a job, which by the way, it's not just any job, right? To get a job in Hollywood, it's like a very specific thing. I I don't know. I don't know how I would react to that, but you know, relationships are all about sacrifice. You just want to know that if you sacrifice for your partner, that they would reciprocate and sacrifice for you in return. It isn't crazy, but if you ask your partner to move across the country for you and shut down their business, don't be surprised when you get a fat alimony bill, which is really what it comes down to, is that he moved his business and, you know, whether or not it made money is going to be decided by the court and he's going to be paid if she profited more than he did. It's absolutely crazy when you make the decision to just uproot your life without any input from your spouse. There should never be a situation where your spouse says, I'm moving and you can either come with me or we're over. He clearly didn't want to do it, but cared more about his marriage, so went along with it. She cared more about her career and forced that ultimatum on him. Both of them were absolutely not on the same page regarding their marriage. I do have to say, the fact that he did move, this isn't like they broke up because he didn't move and it's a wonder what would have happened. He did move across the country for a job that is pure. It'd be like moving across the country as a real estate agent. It's like, no, it's good that you know how to sell a home, but you have to build a whole new client list. Like, guys, are we even having the same conversations here? You know, he really shouldn't take in that 10K and ended this as privately as possible, not just for Rachel's career, but his own as a business owner. Yikes. Is an extra 6K really worth putting all your business on the internet and attached to your name for years? Someone said, maybe it is when he's the one, only one getting dragged. I swear people act like Rachel can do no wrong. Brian sucks, but do people really think she doesn't? Um, saying the idea that Brian sucks and she doesn't, my positive way of saying that is they're both trying their best. I don't think either one of them suck. I, I don't. And I don't know Rachel. Maybe she had, maybe she would have different opinions of me, but I've only championed her and, you know, it's whatever. You know, I think she's great at what she does. I actually walked by her once and said, hi, she probably didn't know who I was, but she was glowing. She lit up the street. And, um, I think she's got a very unique, um, ability to be super charismatic and she's great on her podcast. <laughs> I mean, how she was behind closed doors. I can't vouch for that. What do I know? Um, someone said, I've been saying this for years, accepting the downvotes. Let's see what they said. I think, um, oh, we don't have it. I think Brian has always been authentic, authentically cringy and bad, but authentically himself nonetheless. Rachel, on the other hand, seems like someone who presents one face to the public and another behind closed doors. I don't like him, but I believe him. Someone said, I believe him too. And I really like Rachel, but it sounds like he wasn't treated very well. It's all very sad. Rachel wasn't taken care of at all. And that's the crux is that after leaving her, he still wants her to take care of him. Shit is damn near abusive. And again, that's where you lose me. Abusive? Really? That's where you have to be careful when you have these conversations. No. Did Rachel work harder than Brian in their relationship? We don't know. She was the star and lead of the show. She picked Brian. They tried their best. When you're the lead of the show, you do get a financial windfall unlike anything any of the contestants ever get. You know what I mean? You get an absolute financial windfall when you're the lead of the show. You usually have to work to maintain that, which she has, but that's the privilege of going on the show. It also comes with people that can be terrible, in her case, racist audience. Like Those things, sadly, will come with the spotlight on you, and also things that will come are exposed to new opportunities, a giant social media following. Now, Rachel, I don't think ever got to a million followers like other people did that were leads before and after her, um, which, again, speaks more towards the audience because they vote with their follow uh, than it does to her. But I think 
I think there is more to be said here with regards to the term disingenuous, and I'm going to open my inbox to anyone in the blogosphere that has these court papers. I personally don't think I'm going to pay for them, but maybe I will. They're only 40 bucks. And we'll listen to what either both sides have to say now that it is full-blown in the public world. And my ask for anybody out here is rather than call me names and say I'm the one being disingenuous, let's just use our critical thinking skills and kind of graze from afar. I always say treat this like the Yellowstone. Stay in your car and just drive through the exhibit. Enjoy it for what it is. Don't interact. Don't send them DMs of hate or anything like that. They are humans. And trust me, they will recover and they will be better off apart because it sounds like this was not going well for them. Those are my thoughts. If you want to continue to support me, go to the Rush Hour podcast. Link below if you want to listen to my conversation that I had with Christina Mandrell and Arlene Mandrell. You're going to love it. Have a good day, everybody. We'll catch you later.